Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, you, Lord Christ. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Savior. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Have you ever spent time in a place where life looks and feels so different that it's almost impossible to remember what your home is like when you're there? Then when you come back home, it's almost impossible to remember the other place. For me, the 11 years that I lived in Europe quickly faded to flat picture postcards as soon as I came back to America. And now when I go back to Europe for a vacation, 
that world pops back into reality as if by magic. While I'm there, it's my life in America that automatically seeps into shades of misty gray. It's as if both places can't exist at the same time. It's as if I'm a different person in each place. My mind is somehow unable to hold together such different worlds with their different languages, customs, even sounds and smells. I believe that's how Simon Peter and the disciples must have felt right after Jesus' crucifixion, as if their lives with Jesus had never existed, as if they were back where they started, cut off from God, cut off from their calling as disciples, as if both realities couldn't exist at the same time. In our gospel reading, the disciples have moved suddenly from their world with Jesus back into the world of their former lives. They've gone fishing in Galilee. The memories of their time with Jesus probably seem unreal. After all, their Messiah has been crucified, defeated by Roman powers. The systems of meaning that they built while listening to Jesus' teaching have suddenly come toppling down under the shadow of the cross. Even the glimpses of resurrection have been vague and shadowy. A wild story from Mary Magdalene about a gardener, strange appearances in the upper room. Were these things that they could hang on to? To top it off, Simon Peter not only drifts aimlessly on the waters where he once found purpose and livelihood, he is especially ravaged by shame. Whenever he thinks of Jesus, his friend, his Lord, he must also remember his own betrayal of Jesus. How the red heat of shame, his own failure and worthlessness, must burn within him. We all know the feeling, the way our minds replay our failures over and over again. Over and over in his mind, Peter hears the crowing of the rooster. He smells that acrid charcoal fire in the courtyard where fear led him to deny being a follower of Jesus not once, but three times. Now, in today's gospel, Peter comes face to face with that dreaded charcoal fire once again. Out of the shame-filled shadows of before arise both Jesus and the smoke of a campfire. Yet, who is Peter now? He's no longer Simon Peter, the rock on whom Jesus will build his church. Jesus calls him Simon, son of John. Once again, he's the unknown, insignificant fisherman whom Jesus met at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus may be raised from the dead, but Simon Peter still wanders in the empty space between our everyday world and our world with God, a space filled with regrets and failures. But look at what Jesus does. He doesn't leave Simon in shame and failure. He invites Simon to join him in his reality, in his new Easter reality. Resurrection isn't only a raising of Jesus' past identity. It's also a raising of the past identities of all those who have been with him. The good news for us we who live lives of trying and failing and trying again, is that Jesus, the victim who loves instead of condemning, raises us up with him. He invites us into a new world of meaning and forgiveness. Being raised with him, being brought into his new reality, we're no longer forced to choose between distant and opposite shores. 
Okay, so how exactly does this work? According to our gospel, the first step is to recognize Jesus. How do the disciples recognize him? In God's miraculous abundance, there's suddenly a huge catch of fish, yet their nets don't break under the load. We too are invited to grasp the abundance of the risen Christ in fleeting yet powerful singular moments, in a satisfying abundance of love that washes over us, hugs and kisses, cards full of well wishes, the company of friends. Or we grasp God's presence in a sudden abundance of grace that carries us through a trial, forgiveness that we don't deserve, meals brought to us when we're sick, debts forgiven. We even grasp it in the breathtaking abundance of beauty in nature, a sunset, a field of spring flowers, a soaring mountain view. God is always present in glorious abundance. God's love is general and hard to grasp, but we can't deny the momentary weight of it in our hands like a net full of fish. Secondly, like Simon Peter, we need to jump in and swim to Jesus. Commentators scratch their heads in this passage over Simon Peter being naked and then getting dressed to jump into the sea. <laughs> but the Greek phrase used here for putting on clothes can mean that Simon Peter belted up his fisherman's smock so that it wouldn't impede his swimming as he rushed to Jesus. What we can gather from this strange verse is that Simon Peter jumps headlong into the gap between himself and Jesus. He leaves the nets full of fish, he leaves the boats and his friends. All he wants is to get back into Jesus' world. When we see the risen Christ, we too are compelled to tie up whatever gets in our way and leap. Yes, I'm afraid that there is always going to be leaping involved. And unfortunately, we usually aren't able to push some kind of magic pause button while we ponder the risks. Third, Peter and the disciples eat with this Jesus who has appeared to them. They allow him to feed them breakfast, just as he fed them before his death all those many times. The meal on the beach represents the Eucharist, of course, the same meal that Jesus prepares for us today. Each time we share in the Eucharist, we, like Simon Peter, are daring to put one foot into the flat, shadowy world of shame and inadequacy. For we partake of the body and blood of the God we condemn. Yet at the same time, we are restored by the forgiveness of the one whom we have condemned. The Easter community is both guilty and restored as it gathers in the name of the one who is both crucified and risen. The Eucharist is an activity that opens up the space between our world and the Easter world, and holds them both together. As we share the bread and the cup, we enter a place in which that strange disjunction between two worlds is bridged, a place in which the old comes together with the new, in which the world that killed Jesus meets the world filled with Jesus. And finally, once we've been fed, Jesus asks us, as he asked Simon Peter, to feed his sheep, to tend the people of God. They're not our sheep to do with what we would like. They're not somebody else's sheep for us to ignore, but they are God's sheep. Our purpose, our meaning in this post-Easter world is to care for them. Our new identity is to follow Jesus, 
to follow him in love and friendship for others, no matter where it leads. Scholars wonder why John alternates two words for love in this text. Jesus asks if Peter loves him using the Greek word agape, self-giving love, the love that Jesus showed us on the cross. Peter, though, answers that he loves Jesus with phileo, the love of deep friendship. Finally, by the third time, Jesus comes to meet Peter where he is, asking him if he has friendship for him. For me, this puzzle shows us the importance that God places on friendship, on relationship. Jesus asks us not just to love with a vague, abstract devotion. Jesus asks us to actively love him and others, to reach out with the kind of love that we show our friends. The psychologist Brene Brown puts it, in recovering from the shame of failure, we must move what we're learning from our heads to our hearts through our hands. So, recognize and live into abundance. Take risky leaps. Be fed by the mystery of the Eucharist. Prioritize relationships. As we do these things, our ordinary lives are made holy. We're made whole to follow Christ wherever he may lead us. You know, Europe will still exist across the Atlantic, whether I'm feeling disconnected from it or whether it's been momentarily made present through a phone call from an old friend. In the same way, our new life and wholeness in Christ exist beneath our doubts and lapses, re-emerging as we feed and are fed. Amen.